Make the choice to begin anywhere in your life, and the journey has started. And along the way, be inspired. Listen to the stories by joining the president of Howard University, Dr. Wayne A.I. Frederick, on The Journey. Many community leaders are lending a helping hand for those who have been impacted by the coronavirus pandemic. We have a new coalition in the district with a strong initiative to stop the spread and to keep the African-American communities informed. Hello, my name is Dr. Wayne Frederick. My guests today are Marie Johns. She's a trustee here at Howard University, and she's also the chairwoman of the Student Life Committee, and Ambrose Lane, who is co-founder of the Black Coalition Against COVID and chair of the Health Alliance Network. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. And so, Trustee Johns, uh, given everything that's been happening uh, recently, especially in the Midwest, in Minneapolis, I know you have roots in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you could start us off by sharing with us your thoughts about what's happening currently and how it's impacting you. Uh, thank you for the invitation to be here, President Frederick. And, um, a response to that question could take the entire time. So I'll certainly uh, limit myself or try to, my heart is heavy. Uh, this is a very challenging time. I am um, married for many years to a man from Gary, Indiana and who had his brushes with the law as a young man, uh, the mother of a black son who, uh, when he was coming home from a sporting event in high school, when we lived in Bethesda, Maryland, was stopped by the police asking him where he was going when he was pulling up in front of his house. So I'm very familiar with the um, challenges and the, the, the fright that comes with being uh, a person who loves black men. Um, my father was a policeman. He helped integrate the police force in Indianapolis. And I recall uh, his stories about nooses and um, uh, profane messages being left for him. Yet he, had, he was able to rise to the level of lieutenant uh, it was a very tough uh, career. It cost my parents their marriage, quite frankly, because it was just constant stress. Uh, but my father made a difference on the force, and I'm very proud of that legacy. So all of those emotions um, are with me now. And uh, I think that the response, the protests, are so important because enough is enough in terms of black men and black bodies. Uh, in general, being viewed as fodder for, uh, for death and, uh, and destruction in this country. It goes back to the beginning of our time here, but it's time to stop. And Ms. Elaine, as we broaden that, as uh, Trustee John said, black bodies, uh, the, corona the coronavirus pandemic has uh, been wreaking havoc on black bodies uh, in our uh, black communities. And as we look at that, uh, describe probably what was the motivation for forming uh, this coalition against uh, such a, a deadly disease that disproportionately is affecting our communities? Well, the Black Coalition Against COVID was formed quite simply to save black lives. Uh, and that's actually what we said when we first got together uh, and began talking about it. But we, we recognized early on the disproportionate negative effect that COVID-19 has had on African-American communities. And in Washington, D.C., over 77 percent of all deaths from COVID-19 are African-Americans. And if you look at how the district is situated, wards five, seven, and eight comprise over 50% of all deaths from COVID-19. So we recognized this early on. We said we need to do something about it. Um, we reached out to various community-based organizations. We reached out to government. We reached out to media. And we set upon a path to try to address some of these issues. Right. Now, the pandemic obviously did not cover over uh, the systemic racism, racism that exists. Uh, th there's no doubt about that. What aspect of that system that has been embedded in our national fabric you think is really coming out and uh, underlying some of these issues that we're seeing? Well, we, we, we really have a double pandemic. Um, we have the pandemic of COVID-19, the coronavirus, which is recent, but we've had a pandemic of racism and white supremacy for a very long time. And unfortunately, uh, with regards to the, the pandemic of racism, herd immunity has not occurred yet. In other words, it's gone around the world more than once, and it has certainly settled in the United States, and it is still here. The latest uh, 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 killing of a black man by a police officer in Minneapolis uh, and the response to it, uh, because they weren't even going to charge him had there not been any videotape. Uh, just exemplifies how much it is still embedded in our society. So it, there is overlap when it comes to COVID-19 and the coronavirus. Um, the, the disparities and the disproportionate effect on African-Americans comes from the fact that there is not 
uh, health equity in many African-American communities around the country, especially in poorer black communities. Uh, and these, uh, the, this inequity has reared its head through the coronavirus, and now the scab has been pulled back. And as we talk about that economic inequity, Trustee Jones, um, you assisted the mayor by co-chairing her committee on small businesses as for the reopen DC. And you've served in the Obama administration uh, in the Small Business Administration uh, Department. What concerns do you have about that growing uh, economic uh, inequity and what impact the, the pandemic may have that may actually worsen that? Well, so there's such uh, intersectionality between these issues, the, the uh, issues that Ambrose raised. And let me hasten to add that I, too, am a member of the uh, coalition. Um, and we're seeing it in, in our work that the health policy experts like Ambrose, the physicians who are part of the work, uh, the clergy, uh, all are in those professions that see these disparities day to day on the ground. I am a bit of an outlier in the, in the, uh, the coalition, but uh, we have become such a, a, um, a tight-knit entity, and the thing that its, its strength comes from its diversity. And so the voice that I try to provide is, let's be concerned about the economic impact of, of what we're doing. And so how does that look in the district? Uh, the, the prognosis for black businesses in D.C. is quite dire. Uh, we've had one wave of, of um, challenge, you know, uh, at this stage of the of the uh, COVID-19, but we know that there are businesses hanging on by a thread, and we're going to see significant loss in those parts of the city that um, uh, that Ambrose mentioned. I mean, there's an there's an overlap that the areas where there have been the, the highest incident of the disease are also going to likely be the areas where we're going to see the most economic devastation. And quite frankly, it's hard to be healthy when you're in poverty. You can't afford the basics of life. You can't afford the roof over your head. It's great that we're supposed to recognize these public health mandates of uh, physical distancing and, and the PPE, et cetera. But there are people who simply cannot distance because of their living circumstances. They, uh, small businesses cannot afford uh, the equipment that they're going to need. Uh, I was pleased to hear announced actually today uh, that uh, the mayor is acting on the re recommendations in the Reopen DC report that say this, this kind of equipment needs to be made available gratis, uh, particularly for the very small uh, neighborhood uh, business corridor uh, companies that are out there and having to learn how to deal in this new environment. And, and, and that's certainly, uh, I think, helpful and a step in the right direction. The CARES Act, um, was intended to provide some stimulus, to provide some cover uh, for small businesses. There's more, there's more evidence coming out every day that some of those businesses that actually may have uh, been left out actually are minority-owned businesses and the ability to apply uh, for those, et cetera. Uh, any, any concerns there and any uh, potential recommendations in terms of what else you'd, you'd want to see in a fourth stimulus bill uh, that's hopefully uh, down the road to help rescue those businesses? Well, I, I'm proud to say that under the Obama administration, we had a very um, focused, uh, a very focused approach to programs based on where the need was. I created the um, uh, Council on uh, Underserved Communities to focus on how to make entrepreneurs <laughs> better supported by the, by the agency uh, that included um, uh, a, a perspective across a diversity spectrum, but it was chaired by uh, someone near and dear to Howard, uh, Kathy Hughes, chaired that uh, that body. What we, um, what I believe is very important is we ha we can't do the peanut butter approach it, locally. If we know we've got a fire raging in Ward Five in terms of the small business community, we don't send the fire truck to Georgetown or to Spring Valley. It needs to go to where the problem is. But we have a problem with doing that. We try to put everybody in the net yeah. as opposed to being honest about where the where the problems lie and crafting solutions to meet those problems. So that's what I think is the most important uh, uh, aspect of what needs to be taken into consideration for the, whatever the next stimulus is. Let's direct the resources to the problem. It was all well and good to say that the uh, PPP program was for small businesses when in fact 80 percent, uh, I believe that uh, that statistic, statistic of the funds went to corporations. That's right. So clearly there was a problem in the design. That's right. Uh, and Ms. Elaine, um, the, the Health Alliance Network, 
Uh, tell us a bit about why uh, the Health Alliance Network was formed in the, fir in the first place and what type of work it, it is engaged in currently. So, so I'm a Ward 7 resident, uh, have been, um, and recognized back in uh, late 2012, early 2013, that there was not a, an advocacy organization to represent the, the residents' needs in terms of health. Uh, in Ward 8, there was a Ward 8 Health Council that was started by the late uh, Mayor Marion Barry. Uh, there was not one in Ward 7, and so I set about the task uh, in 2013 of founding the Health Alliance Network to be that voice for residents. Uh, since that time, we have expanded into Wards 5, 4. Uh, we have a little bit in 1, uh, and we still have partners in 8. So we have well over 150 partners across the city. Um, you know, our emails reach more than 4,000 people every time we send something out. And it's basically about uh, advocating for better health conditions, better legislation, uh, uh, a better policy. Um, and so we've been very forthright and we've become the largest community-based health advocacy group in the District of Columbia in that short period of time. And, and what type of things have you uncovered in terms of the disparities that exist in Ward, Ward 7 and 8? And for our listeners, I think to paint that picture appropriately, uh, the population of Ward 7 and 8 uh, is roughly between 90 and 95 percent black. Mm -hmm. uh, the life expectancy uh, in that ward, I believe, is uh, just over 70 years. Uh, if you go to Ward 3, uh, where it's 95 percent white, the life expectancy is 87.6 years. There's at least a 15.6 year difference uh, in the life expectancy, just to paint the picture of what. And, and that actually, if you look at D.C., uh, smack in the middle is the U.S. Capitol, where lots of legislation and laws are placed on the books that could probably right. <laughs> fix this very issue. But just to paint that picture, so what types of things are you seeing underpinning the struggle? So I was, I was uh, blessed enough. Uh, the mayor appointed me to her Commission on Health Equity. Um, in, in 2018, the commission issued a report from which you're quoting from. Um, and those are averages in terms of life expectancy. It, it's actually broader than that if you go to particular uh, uh, neighborhoods. So for example, Palisades versus Anacostia, there's actually a 21 year difference in life expectancy. So those are averages. So, so let me just paint a picture for you. Uh, in Ward 8, uh, the rate of diabetes is the highest in the Western Hemisphere, higher than any country in the Western Hemisphere. In Ward 7, which is at 13.7% uh, uh, rate of diabetes, it is higher than, it is the sixth, no, seventh highest in the Western Hemisphere. Um, even if you're looking in the world, Ward 8 has the seventh highest rate of diabetes in the whole wide world. And so these are ongoing, pressing chronic disease issues. And as we all know from COVID-19, uh, one of the worst chronic diseases you can have that, that lends itself more towards death is diabetes, kidney disease, and liver disease. So if, if there's already a high prevalence of that, that's why you're seeing the high death rates in Ward 8 from COVID-19. Now, one of the things that the pandemic has clearly uh, unveiled is who we regard as frontline workers, who we regard as essential workers, and who all of us realize we can't live without. And so especially when it relates to business and uh, the economic impact, there also is that social impact of people who are traveling uh, significant distances to mm -hmm. uh, get to work, et cetera. What are your thoughts about uh, the testing and the impact on uh, the COVID-19, uh, from COVID-19 on those frontline workers as we start reopening and bringing them back uh, to these jobs? Uh, are those people that we should be testing uh, more frequently and are those people that we should be providing PPE for? Uh, it's one thing for the small businesses, but what about the workers who are actually uh, coming there? Uh, indeed, it's a case of all of the above, uh, in, in my opinion, um, and it was, um uh, a great cause for celebration and, and um, uh, pride in the work of the coalition when uh, it was just yesterday that the um, uh, Pennsylvania Avenue Baptist Church, Reverend Dr. Uh, Kendrick Curry, um, is hosting a new testing site in Ward 7 uh, and a part of Ward 7 that uh, also abuts um, Ward 8. So a very geographically important part of the city. Howard is a partner. And so those kinds of community-based facilities we're going to need more and more of because testing needs to be ubiquitous. Um, because the other thing about this uh, disease is that you can be tested one day uh, and contract the disease the next. So th the whole notion of testing is something we're just going to be living with for quite some time until we have a, a vaccine. Testing is going to have to become a, a routinized um, uh, just part of what, how we live now, I think, 
and it's a fresh memory for Ambrose. <laughs> yes. I've had the test as well, but I know yeah. it's you still feel the test. I, I still feel the test. I got tested. I don't feel it anymore. I, I, was, I was there at the event yesterday. Yeah. It was a wonderful event. I did get tested. As a matter of fact, my wife and my six-year-old got tested as well. Uh, I have to admit my six-year-old was very brave, so I'm, I'm very happy for him. Uh, I had some trepidation because I thought it was a, a was a 12 inch swab that was going to go towards my brain. <laughs> it certainly looks that way. Um, but it, but it wasn't as bad it, when it when it comes down to it. It wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. Um, but but testing bec becomes a very important critical role because you really can't do contact tracing without doing adequate testing. Um, and that's one of the things that the Black Coalition uh, did. They partnered with the Health Alliance Network. We did a, a seminar, a webcast on uh, contact tracing. We had some notable figures such as um, uh, George Benjamin, the executive director of the American Public Health Association, and others, Adora Iris Lee, who uh, was with the Department of Health and ran the contact tracing during the AIDS epidemic in Washington, D.C. So we had some experts to talk about contact tracing. But testing is very important. I'm very, very happy uh, that Howard came to my part of the city where where I live uh, and opened up a testing site at Pennsylvania Avenue Baptist Church. Let's, let's talk a little bit about contact tracing. Um, cultural competence has to uh, be weaved and wedded into this. And especially, again, when you, you go back to businesses, et cetera. Uh, some of this has gotten sophisticated already. Here at Howard Hospital, uh, employees are on their way in to work and fill out um, a questionnaire on their smartphone um, that quickly ask about symptoms, et cetera, that gets to you know, sent to their supervisor and a decision can be made as to whether they should uh, come in or not because of the risk of exposure and whether they probably need to get tested. We've also uh, decided to test everyone in the hospital and the residents are coming in getting their temperature checked uh, every morning before they're disposed to go to work. Very elaborate. Huge hospital, large university. Uh, that, those are the types of things we have to do. You have a small business with three people. Uh, one person doesn't come in, or one person gets a, a fever, and they're going to take a fever reducer to avoid coming to work. What is a potential solution as we start talking about contact tracing yeah. to really convince the community and businesses mm -hmm. that this is necessary? Well, part of the, uh, the foundation of the coalition was to address the cultural competency need. Um, and because we are not crazy, black people, we are not crazy. Our fear and suspicion about the government uh, intruding into our personal lives is founded in uh, the harm that has happened over the generations. And so we knew that having people who could um, relate at being part of the contact tracing process was critically important. Otherwise, it probably would not have worked well in our community for someone to just show up and say, you know, who have you been with? Where have you gone over the past few days in order to really uh, build out a, um, a robust body of data on the, on the contact uh, that supports contact tracing? And that's why we've done um, the innovative things through the coalition's work. Um, Ambrose, I hope he'll talk about the wonderful webinars that he has run. We've done, we've used the arts, poetry, slams in order to speak to the younger generation. We've, we have um, Antoine Glover, for those who've watched The Wire, uh, uh, Big G Glover, his visage uh, wearing a mask is on Metro buses Metro now. Buses. So that, right. again, we're sending, trying to send the message as creatively as we can uh, across the breadth of the, of the uh, black community to say, this is important, we're all in this together, it's not over, we need you to, to participate to keep all of us safe. And so we knew that that was a very important part of the work. And, and actually, I, I want to give kudos again to Howard University, both uh, WHUT, WHUR, uh, that have that has uh, ran a number of promos in terms of for the community on the radio station, um, and and I would be remiss if I didn't mention that some of the some of the work that Marie has done with the Black Coalition and connecting us to the Cha DC Chamber of Commerce and the business community and get the messages out through the business community as well. Um, so I, I wanted to make sure that that was that that was mentioned, um, but but getting back to contact tracing, it's probably if there's anything that requires cultural competency, it's going to be contact tracing, and for the district, uh, it's a work in progress, and, and, and I would say that it's a work in progress, and hopefully they will get the kinks out of the contact tracing program and get it right so that uh, African American communities can feel safe and, and understand the need to participate in contact tracing. Right. Uh, D.C. held its primary election um, this week uh, because of the setup of the city. The primary election in, in a lot of ways is uh, the election. Big race, yeah. Uh, it, it's the big race. Um, and when you look at out at the political landscape, uh, tomorrow, I will address the U.S. Chamber of Commerce uh, Board of Directors about 
the COVID and the disproportionate impact, as well as uh, the issue uh, around police brutality and, and you know, the disrespecting uh, of, of black bodies and black lives. What types of messages should we be taking to political and community leaders? I would say no more. You know, we have to, we, we have to evolve. Um, and we have to evolve to a point where this kind of thing just does not happen, whether or not we are rewriting um, the types of training that police officers get around the country or whether or not it is instituting uh, penalties if, if you go overboard, whether or not it is uh, looking at some of the things that Black Lives Matter has talked about in terms of reform. Um, the, but we have, to, we have to say no more. Um, when it comes to the, the health disparities and, and the lack of equity, we have to say no more because there's going to be another iteration of some type of flu pandemic. We're not even through this one yet, and we could be having a relapse in less than a year, and some people say. Um, and so how are we preparing the African-American community and those communities that are going through these high rates of chronic disease? How are we preparing to protect those communities against these types of things? Mm -hmm. The one thing I, I agree with what Ambrose is saying, and the thing that I would uh, add is that, and this is work that I've tried to do over my <clears throat> many years here, and, and it's something that still troubles me. Washington, D.C. is the most resource-rich jurisdiction on the planet, I believe, in terms of the civic capital we have, the intellectual capital, we have the resources of the, of the federal government, we have cold, hard cash. We have got to have political leadership that knows how to connect all those things together and is honest. We have to call it for what it is. The, the elementary schools in Ward 8 um, are not, they, they don't look like the elementary schools in other parts of town. Elementary schools in Ward 3, they don't look like well, elementary schools in Ward 5. We've got to be honest about where the resources need to go. Stop letting niche factions call the day, the moneyed interest call the day, and really have leaders who love the people enough to know that we truly are connected. I mean, the, yes, the disease is hitting our community in a, in a uh, is devastating our community, community more deeply, but the fact of the matter is, if this disease runs rampant, other people will be infected a, as well, and they are being infected. And so, yeah. it, we don't, I don't want to live in a place that figures that no, well, it's okay for some people to get sick because I'm safe, because the truth is, we, none of us are safe if we're not all being treated in a way that uh, can provide a, a safe community. So, I want honesty, I want uh, calling it like it is, I want resources that are provided where they are most needed, and I think we've had some troubles with that. And, Enough is enough. Well, to piggy, piggyback off of what Marie just said, I, you know, the Health Alliance Network has called for a Marshall Plan for Ward 7 and 8. For those that are not familiar with what happened after World War II and how uh, the European powers actually uh, put money together to rebuild Europe, we need to be able to do the same thing for Ward 7 and 8 and parts of Ward 5. Yeah. No, I, absolutely. And, and it's clear that unless there's intervention of a major kind, this is not something that we can uh, bite around the edges. Uh, I think we've laid bare... Uh, and wide open, uh, the problems that are there, there's no secrets um, that it exists. I, I don't think anyone can bury their head in the sand That's right. uh, about these issues. We cannot be a city of one bedroom condos <laughs> for young white people. Because quite frankly, the reason that the young white people want to come and spend lots of money for a one or two bedroom condominium is because of the richest of the culture that black people have created here. And so, we are at, at risk of losing that, quite frankly, if we don't understand what the, 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 um, the v deep value that riches of that culture has and why this city needs to have everybody here, because that's what's made us great in the first place. Absolutely. So, Ambrose, as uh, I, I close, um, first I want to thank you for the work that you do. Um, anyone who comes on this show has to answer one last closing question, so I'll give you the first shot and then we'll go to Trustee Johns, and that is why Howard? Why Howard? Uh, when I was in high school, I wanted to be an architect, and I was choosing between Howard and Morehouse. Morehouse didn't actually have an architecture program. It was Georgia Tech, so I would have had to go to both colleges. Um, but Howard is the mecca, uh, and, and Howard's program was better. 
Um, and so I was just drawn by the, the prestige of Howard University. Um, and I have no regrets. Uh, I've been involved, I was involved as a student. I was in Howard University Student Association. Um, we used to speak every Friday night, and uh, every Friday afternoon, it, right in front of Blackburn Center. Uh, I, I'll never forget nights and, and, and days in the punch out. Um, and, and being involved politically, that's where I honed my early political skills, was here at Howard. Um, and so I, I, I love being here. Um, and it was, it, was not a, it was not a hard choice after a while. I appreciate that. And Trustee Jones, um, every time I read your bio, I always feel that I need to go back in and rewrite something in there because I, I always assume that you're a Howard alum um, because of the, the, the massive uh, involvement you've had here. Uh, you've chaired uh, the, the board of the middle school. Your husband now uh, chairs it. Uh, you chair the student life committee. You've been, uh, this is your second uh, tenure as a, as a trustee um, with the Obama administration appointment um, in between. Why, Howard, for the young people who are out there in the streets protesting today who are looking for some type of hope, why Howard University should be that hope? Howard is our crown jewel. Uh, that's the way I view it, and I feel it a privilege to be a part of the Howard community. Uh, just a, another bit of family lore, my grandfather uh, was unlettered, very little formal education, but he was a brilliant businessman. He grew a small uh, lawn care service into a landscaping company where he was one of the first black companies in segregated Indiana to win government contracts to maintain the roads, uh, the grass along state roads. My, my father was the second of his five sons, um, but one of his sons, uh, William, who has passed, they've all passed on, uh, my grandfather sent to Howard University to the School of Pharmacy. I did not know that. <laughs> and my uncle uh, was, was proudly returned to Indiana with his newly minted Howard degree, and not one pharmacy would hire him hmm. as a black pharmacist. So my grandfather, and this is why I believe in the power of black business, he set up, he created a community pharmacy in an area of town that didn't have a pharmacy. He built a pharmacy and put his son to work there. So Howard, means everything to me because really it, it, it's part of our family story on our journey on the first steps of, of moving into the middle class. And um, again, if we didn't have Howard, we'd have to create Howard. And, and I just, for the, all the people listening, I just hope that send us five dollars because we need it. And Absolutely. Howard Strong. And, and my, my younger brother and younger sister uh, came through Howard. So I, I appreciate it. And again, I appreciate what both of you are doing, um, not just uh, with this pandemic. I think the other thing that we learn every day about community leaders is that uh, they don't just show up um, when there's a crisis. They're there when no one is looking and both of you uh, have been stalwarts of this community uh, for quite a long while. My adopted home, like I like to tell people, and so I really appreciate all that you're doing and especially with this particular initiative. Thanks for being here. My guest today was Marie John. She's a trustee here at Howard University and the chair of our Student Life Committee and Ambrose Lane Jr., the co-founder of the Black Coalition Against COVID and chair of the Health Alliance Network. I'm Dr. Wayne Frederick. Please join me next time on The Journey. This program was produced by WHUT, Howard University Television, and made possible by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.